So I want to thank my mother, Pichamal Nagarajan, first for introducing me to the Kolam while I was growing up, going back and forth between India and the U.S. as a child. Um, and many times it was the only thing that we carried back and forth um, that seemed familiar to a bi bispherical childhood. Um, the Kolam always came with us in my mother's hands. It's also a privilege and honor to be in this setting, um, doing this talk uh, with my mother to accompany me. And I want to thank um, J.D. Talasek also, the director of the program, to invite me to do this. Um, this talk is a shortened version of an entire chapter of my forthcoming book on the Kolam. Um, and if after this talk you're interested in uh, being on a mailing list uh, for getting a notice about the Kolam, let me know. I'm going to be passing out a, a sign-up sheet for that. Um, so this book has 12 chapters in it, and one of the chapters is on mathematics. And I just want to give you a little bit of a taste of the others, um, just so you have the context of in which the mathematics is embedded within. Um, so one of the, the facets will just be the basic facts of the kolam. First, the word kolam is a Tamil, and it means beauty uh, in the Tamil language. And I will be showing you, let me show you first, oops, how a kolam is made. This is made out of rice flour, and it can be made out of dry or wet rice flour. And my mother is going to be giving a demonstration after um, our discussion, showing, demonstrating both kinds. This is in Chennai on the threshold of a dancer, Chandraleka's house on the beach. And this is one of her dancers who's making this. And here's my mother making the kolam at a TEDx conference called Teaching Compassion in Richmond, California, a few years ago. And so she'll be making something similar today. This is made with wet rice, wet rice flour, whereas the other one was with dry rice flour. What's interesting about this particular design, it's, it's called katta design, the um, square column. And these are very similar to architectural prototypes, like the top view of a design of a temple. And you can see the towers and the gopurams. It's almost like a fold out of an architectural template. And it's very mysterious as to how they landed up in, these des in this design tradition. So here are some examples uh, from Sri Viliputur. Um, I spent about seven years traveling back and forth between India and the United States, um, researching the Kolam. And um, I found you know, tremendous amount of reasons why women make the Kolam. And part of the reason is to feed a thousand souls, which has to do with uh, the first ritual act of a Hindu should be to feed a thousand souls. So you're, you're acting, you're trying to get a karmic accounting system ahead of yourself as you wake up in the morning. So um, the kolam is, because it's made out of rice flour, it's edible, it's an edible painting. So it's eaten by birds and worms and uh, small creatures. So if you fed a thousand stranger souls, obviously most people can't feed a thousand human souls. It'd be only kings or very rich merchants who could do that every day, but every human being could make these designs and actually feed a thousand animal souls. And that was just as good in terms of your karmic accounting as feeding a thousand human souls. And so um, you started out with a set of points ahead, you know, every morning. Every morning. So every morning these are made by 20 million women 
in Tamil Nadu, in South India, um, and by Tamils around the world. So that's also in Sri Lanka, Malaysia, um, sometimes in Paris, sometimes in Sicily, uh, wherever Tamils have immigrated, in London, Washington, D.C., uh, California. Um, wherever you find Tamils, you will also find the kolam as well. Um, this is one of the labyrinth columns, um, and these are pulli columns, dot columns, or shuri columns, and these were the ones that have most fascinated mathematicians. How I got into this, I resisted getting into this whole mathematics of the kolam, as you can imagine, coming from anthropology or art history, although I started out in engineering at University of Maryland just for a year and a half, <laughs> but I walked away into economics and into other fields. And so, but in 1993, I, you know, I was in the middle of my Fulbright research year, and a dear friend, C.V. Shachadri, who had helped start the IITs in Kanpur and other places in India in the 50s and 60s, you know, I thought we were just going to go for a swim on the beach, and instead he gives me a stack of books and journal articles literally this high, full of articles about column and mathematics. And he said, Vijaya, your work will not be complete until you digest all these. <laughs> so um, I discovered a whole world. And again, I was like, I'm just going to limit this to a footnote. And then the footnote grew to a section, and then it grew to a chapter. Um, and so that's where it is now. Um, so I'll describe to you there are four aspects, symmetry, fractals, array grammars, and infinity. So those are the four aspects that I discovered. Um, these are instant columns. They can be done in two minutes. The columns can be done, can they also take seven hours, um, depending on the mood of the woman of the house. So you can actually read the mood of the woman of the house by the amount of time she has to make a column. Um, there are also binary oppositional categories of hospitality. So if you don't see a column in front of a household, it usually means that there has been some uh, action in the life flow of the household that makes it inhospitable to strangers. So there's an incapacity to feed a stranger. Um, and so the house or the door is closed, essentially. The household is closed. So um, if there's been a death in the family, for example, for a certain number of days, depending on the caste and the region, you will not make a column. So someone who comes to the house will immediately know that there's been something that, that has happened. Um, here's, uh, there's also a lot of competition among the columns as well. And here you see kind of simple connect the dot columns with the lotus flowers, which is a representation of the goddess Lakshmi. You see the kata column, the square column again, though, like the, similar to the one that my mother made. Um, and then another connect the dot as well. This was made by three daughters. And they're obviously competing with each other in front of their house to draw the best column. Um, this is a, a beautiful scene from the city of Chidambaram, which is where the dance of Shiva comes from if some of you are familiar with that sculptural image. Um, and this is in December, where uh, the mobile image of Shiva has actually walked through um, the town. And so hundreds and hundreds of women literally uh, go in front of this gigantic chariot, this wooden chariot, um, as it's moving. You know, It's pretty dangerous in some ways. I mean, that's where the whole word Jagannath comes from. Um, but they would swiftly make these columns in front of the gods and goddesses to welcome them. Well, to welcome them. Here's my mother making it in front of our house. Um, this is a, a, a wayside um, area in uh, Tanjavur. So what you have in one of the key qualities that both mathematicians and women who make the column talk about is symmetry. And you've noticed that in various columns. There's a mirroring symmetry, um, usually, sometimes. It can also be turned 45 degrees. Um, and there will also be different aspects of symmetry that will uh, turn up. Um, so you see different kinds of pulli columns, the dot columns, and you see the symmetrical line that you can draw between them. And both mathematicians, mathematicians have studied them, Western trained mathematicians, both in India as well as elsewhere. As I got into the column and mathematics field, I discovered over 100 journal articles um, coming from Eastern Europe to England to the United States um, and Madras of mathematicians who've worked on the column. So it's a huge field. And in fact, I'm very grateful there's a woman who's just returned from India on a Fulbright who's doing a whole, uh, whole work just on mathematics on the column. So I'm, this is like a teaser for her work coming up. There's another set of bully columns as well. These are from notebooks. Women often carry notebooks uh, with them, and they usually practice um, every afternoon. 
Here's another set of examples uh, of symmetry as well. It's also related to the knot tradition in mathematical theory. So here you see the laying down of the dots. So the, the, it's, a, it's a remarkable to me the spatial eye of drawing the mapping, the gridding of the column. It's so even and proportional um, to the eye, um, you know, without a scale, without a ruler, et cetera. Here's a 14-year-old girl who's made a column. And usually they're bounded. Um, some of them are open, but many of them are bounded as well. What's interesting about these pulley columns also, they're usually one continuous line uh, without a break, and so they're only crossed over once. And these type of columns have become very interesting to computer scientists because they're trying to um, you know, create an efficient way of moving across space and time. And so these have been very useful to them energetically, how to move energy um, through. Oops, let me go back. So this is also one of the grand ones, very beautiful. And here's another one that's made out of wet rice flour in, a, in the Madurai temple. Again, this is one continuous line that's done, and it's done by four women. So sometimes there are group columns, and this happens to be a group column. Um, and sometimes you have the red kavi, which is also a symbolically sacred color as well. And also mistakes can be made, too. So you see, I just wanted to show that it's not always perfect. There's always mis sometimes there can be mistakes, and so you have to erase the mistakes as well. There's some more symmetrical columns. And then the next um, set of uh, mathematical principles, I mean, I've chosen four, but there are you know, more like 20 different kinds of principles that are embedded in, in the column themselves. Um, so here is one of the things that was striking to me is the whole idea of array grammars. Um, and so with computer scientists, one of the ways that we think about the column is as a language system, as a grammar, as a pictorial visual grammar. So just as we think of, when you think of language, how do you, you know, A plus you know, T is equal to at. So the same way you can imagine the, the different parts of the column as representing um, a certain iconic form, and then how do you create the next form. So even in teaching the computer how to make a column, they learned a lot about the computer. <laughs> in terms of how to make the computer um, do what, to, to make a column. So here you see the computer scientists having broken up the different kinds of the column, and then how do you attach them together. The other aspect that I found fascinating is fractals. Um, and this is something that you can start with a very simple, like for example, a nine dot column, and then you can see it expanded, uh, you know, and, and essentially to infinity. Um, so you have here again another symmetrical column that's a combi column um, that can also that's also integrated into a larger fractal. So it just basically is a subunit that's reproduced. Um, the way that women speak about it, Tamil women often speak about it as as kind of a creating a sense of infinity. So they speak of, and this is a more subtext in their speech rather than something explicit that I caught, is it's almost as if there's an infinite fabric of space and time, and that the column, especially the pulli column, the dot columns, are a way to capture almost like a piece of cloth, like a large piece of cloth, an infinite piece of cloth that you capture on the ground for that moment of seeing that you're making the column, but that you're always aware of the infinite directions in which the column can expand itself. So here's a mango pattern that's, again, reproduced as a fractal as well. So you can see fractal and infinity here represented. Here's a beautiful column. I love this is during the Pongal Festival, which is in mid-January. So if you have a chance to visit India between mid-December and mid-January, that's the best time to catch the column making. Um, that's the column making season. And Pongal in the middle of January is the heyday of column making, those three days, three to four days. And so you have. Um, you know, every woman competing with each other to make the largest column that can be possibly made in front of their household, in front of the threshold of the house. And um, I love this one because this, this sort of captures that sense of infinity, you know, in this column, that you're just getting this little bit. Um, and it was interesting, I, I had this intuition, I thought, you know, I've only been, I've only studied the column or talked to women in, about the column in electrified villages. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, I really should go to see the column making in non-electrified villages. You know, what would it be like to see it just with 
because the, the key thing is that the column is made at dawn before the first rays of the sun hit the first threshold of the house. And so I was curious what the column would look like in a non-electrified village. So I, I finally found one. It was hard to find. Um, and I, what I was stunned by, because until then, I always thought it was the eye, it was the gaze that helped create the column besides the hand that made the column, that it was, that it was the eye that shaped the patterns. But what it turned out was that it was as much the body, because women couldn't see in the dark. There were kerosene lamps that punctuated the darkness, but they were making the column in near darkness. I couldn't see a thing. And yet they were making these fantastic designs. So I realized it was almost like a choreographic movement of the body through space, and that the columns were just really leftovers of that choreographic movement, almost like a dance in the dark. Here's a spectacular column. This is probably the most spectacular column that I saw. This was, a, this was in Mayuram. And again, she was 14 years old. It takes about six years to master the art of the column making from the age of six to 12. So by 12, you're considered to be a master. And uh, so this took her about three hours to make. And again, one continuous line. So you can see why mathematicians got fascinated by these columns. And part of this uh, whole work um, is embedded within the field of ethnomathematics, um, which is com the combination of anthropology and mathematics. And there's a wonderful woman um, named Marsha Asher, who is a mathematician and an anthropologist, who's written one of the key articles about the column in math, if you're interested in pursuing this, and is published in the uh, Science uh, Journal. Um, and it's a beautiful article just illustrating um, you know, how the column functions in mathematical traditions. Um, also, another work that two other books that I found very useful in thinking about this, and they were great inspirations for me. Uh, one was by Jadran Mimika on intimations of infinity, the cultural meanings of Ikwaya counting number system. And so, what Marsha Asher says is there were about 6,000 cultures, and many of them had mathematically embedded design traditions in the arts and crafts. So most of them did. They just didn't weren't studied because when we when anthropologists encountered them, they didn't think of studying the mathematics embedded within these traditions. What's interesting about the column is that, and what she points out, is that the column is one of the few embedded indigenous traditions that have actually contributed to a mathematical tradition, to the Western mathematical tradition, which is rare. So it's kind of, you know, it sort of flips the role of mathematics. Rather than just being embedded in a traditional design tradition, it's actually helping computer scientists understand something elemental about their own work. So it's contributing to the development of Western mathematical knowledge. Another book that really helped me a lot is George Lakoff and Rafael Nunez's books, book that is called Where Mathematics Comes From. And he really talks about the body um, being essential as a metaphoric way of understanding mathematics. And so his book also really helped me he also lives down the street in Berkeley, so I could ask him questions. <laughs> you know, so he loaned me his book, and he was so excited. You know, made me tea, and so we spent two and a half hours discussing mathematics of infinity in the column and how he was reading it. So um, I just want to end with this, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.